All right, we'll get started here. Welcome everybody to our latest Clean Tech Nation webinar briefing series. This latest session is uh, based on our recent report, Getting to 100. I'm Bryce Yonker, Clean Edge Director of Business Development. We have a couple hundred folks registered for today's session, and it's going to be a lively discussion. Just a few quick housekeeping notes. Everybody here is in listen-only mode, but we do want it to be interactive and capture as many questions and comments from the participants as possible. To do that, you likely are familiar with the interface, but just to point it out, there's a drop-down box for chat and questions on your GoToWebinar um, feature. Click that, type in your question, hit enter, it'll come through. I'll be moderating those questions and sending them over to Ron, who's moderating the panel today. One more note before we get started. On January 12th at the same time, 9, 9 o'clock Pacific, we're going to have another webinar focused on governments that are working to get towards 100% mass deployment of renewables. So if you'd like to join that, go to cleanedge.com and register. We'll have a reminder on that at the end of today's session. I'm going to hand it over now to Clean Edge Managing Director Ron Pernick. He's going to be moderating and taking us through today's session. Thanks, Bryce, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, as Bryce said, this is based on our latest report, Getting to 100, and today we're focused on corporations that are leading the charge. Um, it's a unique time to be having this conversation. As many of you know, uh, there's an unprecedented number of political leaders meeting right now in Paris, working to strike a deal on carbon reduction commitments. We're seeing major headlines almost every day from new corporate and investor commitments. Um, so we're excited to be having this conversation. Uh, the goal of powering a company's operations with 50%, 75%, or even up to 100% renewable electricity would have seemed preposterous not long ago. But increasingly, a growing number of companies are aiming to achieve such targets or have already reached such goals, as we highlight in our latest report, which was commissioned by SolarCity. Uh, with us today, I, I want to welcome a stellar group uh, to help us unpack and understand the trends that are unfolding and really get into the nitty-gritty of how companies are achieving many of these goals. We have Marty Sedler, Director of Global Utilities and Infrastructure at Intel. We have Amy Davidson, Executive Director of North America, the Climate Group, and also part of RE100. We have Travis Anderton, Global Director of Sustainability and Property Protection from BD and Eric Fogelberg, SVP, Commercial Sales and Storage Solutions, SolarCity, uh, welcome all. Um, be before we go uh, into the interactive portion of our webinar, I want to highlight a few tables and charts and key findings from our Gain to 100 report. And as, as Bryce mentioned, please, uh, we like to get as many questions as possible from the audience, so enter those questions into the chat box at any time, and uh, we'll get to them at the end of the webinar session. As highlighted in our report, uh, the market for renewables is expanding rapidly. Between 2000 and 2014, the global market size of the solar and wind sectors expanded from 6.3 billion to 190 billion, which represents a CAGR of 27.6%. During the same time frame, installed global solar PV capacity experienced a 14-year CAGR of 42.8%, which we've said many times in the past is more akin to the high-tech sector. And remember, that's a 14-year CAGR. Renewables represented approximately 59% of net additions to global power capacity last year alone, with wind, solar, and hydropower dominating the market. But much more will need to be done if we are to move from today's 23% of total global electricity generation from renewables to the far more ambitious numbers that we're talking about today. As we highlight in the report, we believe five major developments are enabling the shift to mass deployment of renewables. These include the significant cost reductions that are making distributed solar power increasingly competitive across a range of geographies. It includes the growth of utility scale renewables from massive solar farms to onshore and offshore wind power. It includes the massive, the race among companies to develop and deliver cost-effective energy storage devices um, to address the variable nature of many renewable energy sources, the significant advances in net zero buildings and deep efficiency, and the advent of both smart connected devices 
and an increasing, increasingly resilient two-way grid. Uh, again, all of these findings are in our most recent report, along with the toolkit, which I'm about to walk you through. There are a range of steps that governments and corporations can take to transition to a significant percentage of renewables. The Renewable Energy Toolkit flowchart here highlights the decision-making process and available actions in each of the main buckets, spanning um, everything from assessing uh, baseline electricity usage to pursuing energy efficiency measures to deploying clean energy to balancing where needed with energy storage. We won't go into the details right now, but this process requires a whole systems approach, one that encompasses a range of decision points and actions, and we believe it requires an all of the above clean energy approach, leveraging the full portfolio of clean energy resources. As we'll discuss during today's webinar, some companies are already at 100% for portions of their operation, either by facility type or geography, including Intel, Apple, Kohl's, and Whole Foods. You can see some of the names up on the tables here. Many others, such as Nike, Google, and Ikea, have set targets to reach 100% in the coming years. I'd now like to, to move to the panelists to explore more deeply what's driving the shift to renewables and how companies are developing strategies and implementing programs. And I'm really hopeful that when we leave this webinar, many of you on the, on the, on the phone call and on the webinar will have a much better idea of how you might do this in your own organizations. Uh, so Amy, I, I'd like to start with you. Uh, the past couple of months have been pretty significant for the RE100 campaign with Nike, Johnson & Johnson, Goldman Sachs, and others joining the list of corporates that have already committed to getting to 100%. Can you share with us from your vantage point what you believe are the biggest drivers influencing these companies to make such aggressive pledges? Amy, on to you. Thanks, Ron. Um, first, let me just quickly tell folks what this RE100 campaign Please. is. It was um, launched um, September 2014, and the climate group leads it in conjunction with CDP, and it's an initiative under the We Mean Business Coalition. And the goal is to get 100 of the most influential companies to commit to going 100% renewable in their global electricity purchases. So, you know, just, Ron, you made that point that, you know, frankly, people thought we were crazy that we would to set a goal this high and this ambitious. But actually, we are on path now for Paris to be over 50 um, companies. Just this week, Microsoft joined um, and Adobe also joined. Um, the campaign. And the whole idea behind it is to drive the market signal from corporates that there is a huge amount of demand for renewable energy. Now the drivers vary, definitely. I mean, each of the companies that are in the campaign, and people can look at the, the re100.org website to, to see who's involved, um, it, they, it varies, definitely. Right now, because of Paris, there is a strong component of folks wanting to participate. There's sort of this um, catchphrase going around, you know, what did you, what did you do when you knew, right? So we all have a responsibility, and I think these companies realize that they do need to play an active role um, in showing their leadership, whether it's for their customers or um, just as part of the um, DNA of, of the company. So that's critical because if we're going to limit global warming to sub two degrees Celsius, we have to be scaling renewable energy as quickly as we can. And so we're very excited that it is um, moving quickly and we're going to accelerate it even further. Other drivers, though, it's a combination. Um, it's definitely um, protecting against price volatility for certain um, companies. Um, and the strategies are different where they are globally. Um, there's a competitiveness issue, um, an innovation issue. Um, so there's a combination that companies come to the table, but they definitely are recognizing that climate change is impacting their supply chains already. So they need to address the issue. And then in, in many parts of the world, it provides a more stable uh, source of energy, particularly um, in India and some of the developing world where um, you get brownouts, et cetera. Um, but also um, they can lock in a price because, you know, wind and solar are free. So, so there's both an environmental and, and economic uh, drivers that are impacting this. Amy, real quick before we go on to, to the next panelist, um, I, I'm assuming, and, and I know this, but maybe you could just enlighten folks, um, different companies have different target dates. Is that correct? Could you 
sort of explain that a little bit because it's a, a pretty big variety. Yeah. Yeah. So just so everybody understands, each company is allowed to set their own target date. And some companies have not figured out when they will get to the 100% yet. So it's just an asterisk. But they're going to work with us as a team. And we also work closely with RMI and WWF and WRI to sort of do this collectively so we can all learn from each other. Um, but, you know, IKEA sets a goal at 2020. Some are already there. Adobe just came on. Their goal to get to 100% is at 2035, and Mars is at 2040. So they're still very ambitious. Um, and then there are a handful of companies that still don't quite yet know when they're going to get there. Um, Great. But we'll and expect the strategy shortly. Great. And for those on the line, we have a lot of those numbers already in the Getting to 100 report. So you can look at that. And all those great NGOs that Amy just mentioned are also in the report. I want to move on now to Marty. Um, uh, Marty, you're, you're in the field doing this. Um, um, and really, Intel has been a significant leader. Uh, the EPA Green Powership Partnership, you've been recognized for multiple years as the largest user of renewables in the U.S with total usage of approximately 3.1 billion kilowatt hours uh, in 2014. It's a big number. Tell us why. What, what's motivating Intel, and, and what is the company doing to achieve such renewable energy deployment? Marty, over to you. Marty, are you still there? Yep, I am. Um, right. Sorry about that. that. You already cautioned us about going to mute, and here I go. Um, <laughs> Intel is always, uh, you know, we've always been focused on sustainability. Uh, we've always been working on water and energy um, and been extremely strong in conservation and our efficiency programs. And we've done that for decades. Uh, back in about 2007, we looked at our, our energy supplies and decided that just reducing uh, conservation and efficiency wasn't enough, that we really needed to up our game. And so we, we tried to take a look at what we could do to do that. And as we looked at it, we said, we can go and start to build facilities. Um, we can do different options, but those will take one to two years. And, and we're, we're kind of an impatient company. So what we decided to do was go in and go big and, 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 and start off strong. Part of our goal is, is some leadership. We really believe that no single entity can change the world or change much of anything. It really takes a huge uh, conglomeration of various companies, policies, regulatory, and everything together. So what we wanted to do is something big enough and strong enough that we're able to attract others uh, to joining in and, and bring others into the game with us. And so that's what we did on the renewable energy uh, in the U.S. is we started off by jumping in to be the largest voluntary purchaser in 2008 uh, of, of green power in the U.S., and the, the Green Power Partnership and Green E helped us substantially uh, with the validation and credibility there. But we knew that wasn't where, where the win was. The win was continuing to grow the program, continuing to raise the bar, continuing to improve. So we immediately started doing physical projects um, to add on to that. So in parallel to going from 50% to 100% in the U.S., we also, uh, as of this year, will have approximately 45 alternative energy projects uh, completed on our facilities, um, and that's solar, and it's micro wind, and it's it's fuel cell, and it's various different technologies. In fact, it's going to be uh, over 11 technology applications, different ones, uh, over about eight countries and about six states and facilities. So it's a very broad-based program. What we really believe in is it's going to take a portfolio of projects, a portfolio of solutions to actually make a difference. And if we can do demonstration of these, if we can prove them out, if we can adopt more and grow, we're hoping the rest of the world jumps in with us. Great. Well, we'll get into more. I'd love to dig in a little bit about some of the technologies you're deploying. And really, that reflects and resonates with what we found out in our report, which we really do believe you need the full portfolio. So let's move on now um, to, to our next speaker, um, Travis, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about BD because I think a lot of people don't know all the things that, that your medical technology company are doing. Uh, you set a goal of getting at least 25% of total energy from renewables by 2015, back in 2010, I believe. The company exceeded that goal by getting to 36% this year. 
Uh, this summer, BD unveiled its 2020 sustainability goals with the aim of reaching 50% renewables by 2020. Uh, what is the company doing uh, on both sides of the equation, both to reduce its energy usage and then acquire renewables to meet this pretty significant goal in, in the pretty near term? Yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, so I, I guess if I look at this, you know, to, to echo Marty's comment, it takes a portfolio approach. It takes a very comprehensive uh, strategy in order to, to move the needle, so to speak, both on the renewable side as well as on the efficiency side. So we have uh, two primary areas of focus uh, and, and several pillars under, underneath each of these that um, we're, we're currently focusing on. So the first area, obviously, is on the supply side. A lot of opportunity there. Uh, our main focus is, you know, low-carbon fuels. So whether it's, um, you know, on the utility side or whether it's fuels that we purchase, uh, you know, for use in our boiler plants and so forth, it's really looking at our supply base, trying to right-size those contracts, trying to ensure that, you know, wh where we source our, our sources of generation from and our fuels are, are uh, low-carbon. Uh, and equally important, uh, our source of renewables. So right now we're looking at a number of options. We have some small-scale uh, uh, fuel cell installations. We have uh, some small-scale on-site solar installations. But what we're looking at now is, is really increasing, um, you know, some generation from renewables, expanding beyond uh, renewable energy certificates and, and, and things like that. So specifically, we're looking at um, you know, site-based uh, PPAs. Uh, we're, we're doing a global review of all of our uh, real estate portfolio at the moment to see where that makes sense economically. Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, utility-based uh, wind and solar installations and partnering with, uh, you, you know, those, uh, those folks that are developing new, new, uh, new base of uh, generation. Um, on the demand side, it's really four areas that we're focusing on currently. So first is demand side management. So we want to make sure that you know we're not excessively loading the grid or or our internal infrastructure. So managing the load appropriately, um, energy conservation measures (ECM). So what opportunities exist to optimize and, and to uh, improve the efficiency of our operations. Uh, and specific to that, uh, scrap reduction and the cost of poor quality, that's a big focus for us right now. So by reducing the amount of unsellable product, we can increase our efficiency. Ultimately, that means that we don't use as much utilities, as much raw material, and so forth. And then uh, equally important is new construction and, and, and capital investments. So we've got a, a concerted effort to develop best-in-class specifications from individual pieces of equipment to systems to entire factories, and so uh, trying to embed that in, in, in the process. These two intersect, really, when you start talking about business strategy, manufacturing architecture. Uh, you, you know, in order to really move the needle here, you need to think about this holistically, and you need to embed it in your business process. And we're finally reaching a point where the programs are maturing, you know, a lot of our businesses, a lot of our plants are getting on board with this. Think about it, they see a lot of opportunity here, both on the on the cost saving side, as well as doing the right thing for the environment, and really, you know, the, the triple the triple bottom line. So, uh, and beyond that, it's reliability. And Travis, before we move on, there's a quick question, uh, just to clarify for everybody: Are you guys focused on getting 50% of your electricity from renewables by 2020, or 50% of total energy? So yeah, that's a great question. So um, our our greenhouse gas reduction target is 50% by 2020. Embedded in that is uh, sourcing of 50% renewables as as part of our overall energy uh, consumption. So it's yeah. not just about electricity. It, yep. it would be you know total gigajoules, 50% of that. Yep. And yep. embedded so in that, well, is 40% uh, efficiency improvement uh, across the uh, enterprise. Yep. Yeah, because so much of what we wrote on the report and really where people have been focused and where it seems attainable is on the electricity side of the equation, but that's quite audible that you're going across your value chain of all energy use. Um, let's move on now um, to Eric. Uh, Eric, uh, as highlighted in the Renewable Energy Toolkit, 
uh, getting a mass renewable adoption will require, as we mentioned earlier, the full range of clean energy options. Can you tell us a bit more about the importance of on-site renewables in the clean energy equation and how you and Solar City are working with clients to help them achieve their renewable electricity goals? Eric? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, yeah, so whether it's working with Intel or BD, uh, we really typically sit down with our customers to understand what are your overall sustainability goals and then help to ID those kind of on-site DD projects where we can deliver cost clean power below the current cost of grid. And I kind of want to emphasize the cost savings aspect. Obviously, you're seeing the, the green value here using clean power. But, you know, when you look at how, and obviously, you know, Marty, Travis, feel free to hop in here. Typically, the Fortune 500 are, are really look at solar now as, a, as really just another hedge. You know, they're typically used to buy one-year strips, spot market, maybe three-year strips. Uh, solar just becomes a longer hedge for them. So, you know, look at the polar vortex a couple of years ago in the Northeast. If you didn't have hedges in place, you really went underwater. So I think they're looking at, at PV as, as part of their overall strategy for energy procurement, uh, locking down power prices, clean power prices below the current cost of grid. Um, so from kind of a process perspective, how do we work with our customers? You know, like I said, we sit down and understand what are their sustainability goals, what does their real estate portfolio from a DG perspective look like across the U.S.? How does that map to where we see projects penciling today? In other words, delivering that clean power below the cost of grid. And then helping them map that into a rollout. Because, you know, when you're talking about multiple rollouts, we help them figure out where do we go first? Uh, what are the incentive programs? What are the ZREC program in Connecticut hit versus New York, Maryland, Mass, SREC program? So it is a little bit of a complex marketplace, and that's kind of the Hopefully, the value we provide to our customers is helping them better understand that marketplace. Um, Great. Go yeah. ahead. So, so, so the other thing I was going to touch on that I think is very interesting, we may touch on more later, is the uh, uses of storage now. So as you talk about DG, uh, it's no longer just PV. It's, it's PV and storage. So from a utility perspective, it's more, hey, how do I load shift? How do I get rid of the intermittent nature of, of solar? Um, but from a Fortune 500 aspect is how do I reduce the cost typically of my peak load? How do I do peak load shaving? So now between the two, uh, these DD projects are delivering lower cost of power as well as shaving down those peak loads. So it's a great combination that, that I think has really been uh, accelerating our adoption of DD. Great. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about energy storage later because I think that's an important part of the equation as we highlighted in, in that toolkit. Um, what I'd like to do now is, you know, we got more than 100 folks on the line. Quite a few of them are companies. Uh, they span finance, retail, manufacturing, high tech. And I just kind of want to go around the, the panel. Um, but basically, what would you say to the C's level executives that are on the line that might be considering developing a renewable energy target and plan of their own? And in particular, I'm wanting, especially for BD and Intel and, and also Solar Cities, you're working with clients, which internal stakeholders need to be around the table to move forward these types of initiatives? Amy, why don't we start with you? Um, what do people need to be thinking about to get this type of aggressive target, uh, you know, get traction within their company? Yeah, well, I would, I would first say that uh, I think it's going to be uh, given an expectation that significant Fortune 500 companies will need to have a renewable energy strategy. And just within the CDP reporting process, this will be highlighted beginning um, next year's reporting cycle. So I just want to flag that for folks that if you consider yourself a leader, you need to have a robust renewable energy strategy. You know, getting to 100, it is ambitious. I mean, we absolutely agree, and not it's not necessarily a clear roadmap, especially because we're asking for a global commitment, and we understand that there are, you know, places in the world where it's just there. nobody knows the path forward yet, but it's a journey, and so that's why we're asking companies to come along. So from a C-suite perspective, it, it really is just making, making that ambitious, knowing that if you're a Fortune 500 company, you can do this in an economical way. And I always like to cite, you know, what IKEA says, you know, the reason why for them making the 100% goal is the fact that if they made a 90% goal, Steve Howard would say, that then 10% of the company isn't working with you. And if you have a 50% goal, then there's going to be confusion. I mean, that's the way it works for, for him and IKEA. But I, I strongly um, suggest putting in a robust renewable energy strategy and trying to see 
how quickly you can move the needle. Um, and if you get to 100, fabulous. Eric, when you're working with companies, who are the internal stakeholders that need to be around the table? Because again, we've got a lot of companies on the line maybe thinking about whether it's you know, getting to 100% or you know, it's getting right. a whole bunch of solar deployed or procuring renewables through any number of means where they're going to try to get to a significant amount. How do you sell yeah. that internally? Yeah, so the core folks that we typically work with are, are different, you know, depends on the size of the company, different folks within the energy procurement. They're going to understand the marketplace in which they're buying energy, what their overall strategies are, what kind of hedges they're comfortable with, uh, and how a longer-term hedge plays into those strategies. Obviously, a sustainability officer uh, helps map that into their overarching goals for reducing the use uh, of dirty energy or getting more clean state, um, as well as some on the real estate side. So typically, once again, depending on, on the, uh, the company, how they're structured, uh, we'll typically have some on the real estate side, making sure we understand kind of what the short and long-term plans are for that facility. We have a river coming up. Uh, are they maybe going to shutter that facility in 10 years, 12 years? Is it an own versus lease? What's the structure? So getting their buy-up as well. Uh, and then obviously, it typically rolls up to the CFO because it's a long-term financial decision. You need to make sure it's the right decision for the company. Right, right. Mar Marty and Travis, you're both at the front lines. You're, you're doing this. Marty, what have you found in terms of who you had to build uh, agreements with internally to, to move these projects forward? Uh, so, so you, you actually asked, I think, two questions. Uh, sure. One was the internal, and the other was, was any advice. So um, on the internal, uh, from our standpoint, you want to get as, most, as many influential people as you can. Um, hopefully, you get a, CS, a CEO level support. Uh, it doesn't mean they have to be keenly engaged, but that they support it. But if not, you need to make sure that you get somebody that has their ear. What we found is, as people have mentioned and just kind of a repeat, that the financial case is often the most difficult thing to do. And so if you can proactively try to find those solutions, uh, some innovative solutions, and state the case holistically to your finance, to your CEO, CFO, so that they understand it's more than just a dollar for dollar. There's a lot more there. You can talk about um, the, the big picture, if they're stock investors um, that, that are going to want these kind of uh, investments. You can talk about the employee interaction for the millennials who, who love it. You get a better work base. You can talk about um, being more relevant in the regulatory forums and being able to shape it rather than just um, be at the back of the parade. So you really do need to, to do that story, as Amy said. You have to have your goal and you have to have it all packaged um, rather than just trying to go in there and say, this is a good thing. It's the right thing to do. It doesn't really win right. very many cases anymore. You asked the other question, which is, you know, what would we tell people? What I usually say is just go do it. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Everybody's so worried about having the ultimate goal and everything outlined exactly. Um, that's not the key. Don't get paralyzed by perfection. That's what we tend to do. Uh, just make some achievable milestones. Something, take small bites, something that's achievable. Know that you can grow it later. You don't have to go all the way in one big step. And that's probably the, the biggest problem that I think we see grab the low-hanging fruit, and, and kind of follow the, the old adages or the old sayings that kind of say, if you don't start, then you'll never get there. So small steps are, will add up to it. And, you know, we kind of look at it as saving money for the future. If you save a little bit at a time and you continually do it, you'll eventually get to your goal. And both those efforts of saving the money and sustainable projects are both going to ensure the future for you and for everyone else. Great advice. Thank you. Travis, do you have anything to add about your experiences about the internal stakeholders that you needed to sort of bring together to, to, to meet your goals? Yeah, so, you know, I echo a lot of the comments from Amy and, and Marty both. Um, you know, it's, it's extremely important, obviously, have a, one or more C-suite champions, you know, and, and, and look for that uh, support anywhere, you know, that we can find it. But Really, within the C-suite, uh, some of our business leaders want to be partners with finance, tax, and treasury because some of this hedging has, you know, tax and, and treasury implications. Um, our real estate group, our, our engineering group, our uh, planning groups. So, re really, you know, 
making the case with the respective functions and, and, and finding these champions uh, that can help build the business case and, and, and be champions for change. And, and you know, once, once you start the process, as Marty mentioned, once you have developed a strategy and you continue to refine that strategy, you can begin to deliver results. You know, you can embed in the business processes uh, wh wherever the, uh, you know, the implications are relevant or, or where, the, where you need to influence those business processes. That's really where you start to see the company change and the momentum start to uh, increase. Excellent. So we're going to move on to another topic. I just want to remind everyone uh, on the call that we will take questions from the audience. So please use the chat box to type your questions in and we'll start collecting those. Um, we talked about this a little bit before the call started. Um, you know, a lot of the fulfillment that we're seeing is happening in the U.S., but, uh, you know, a lot of these targets and goals are global. Uh, so I'd just like to find out what are the unique challenges facing you as you launch efforts internationally and, and sort of what you're finding in terms of the ability to actually uh, procure renewables uh, in, in jurisdictions outside of the United States. Marty, why don't we start with you because I know you've been working on that quite a bit. Yeah, it, it's probably our, our number one challenge to setting the broader base goal because we're in so many countries that don't have programs. And they don't have methodologies to or, or criteria to actually deliver uh, a renewable or a green energy. And our desire is to stay local first. I mean, we, we believe that you should try to do it local. You really don't want to go grid and other countries if you can help it and cross over. It just doesn't have the same um, impact or the same storyline. So, so as we've looked at them, what we found that was kind of interesting is that some of the countries that you believe are the furthest away end up being the fastest adopters. Hmm. So an example would be something like India, where we always felt that the power goes out three times a day and has a horrible infrastructure and, and has all the problems. They've also been the most willing to actually move. And so, you know, don't discount those, those kind of countries that you think are off the roadmap. They're actually the ones that are sometimes most progressive, and we believe we can almost get to 100% in India within the next year. Uh, through excuse, excuse, in the next year. Yeah, in the oh. next year. Be it we already have three solar facilities on the property, uh, solar electric. We're adding some fuel cells to decrease off of the coal and to just decrease it off. Um, we are then bringing in some 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 credits a little bit, but we're buying offsite wind. And then we have all solar, 100% solar hot water. So we're using a mix of different things to, first we're trying to drive down the footprint, and then we're trying to capture the rest of it. And, and I don't know if you can share up. this, but what does your footprint look like in India? Are you able to share that in terms of what we're talking about, in terms of how much size. climate? You know, well, the, the, the site is going to be um, uh, very soon about six megawatts. It's, okay. it's, running, at about, it's running at about four right now. Uh, we have a... a Three solars that that, and we're adding a fourth that'll be uh, almost a couple of megawatts or close. Uh, we have a, a, a megawatt uh, plus, a couple of megawatts of fuel cell going in. We have 100% uh, of the hot water is solar hot water, and then we're picking up the rest of it off-site uh, from from some wind and some other sources. And again, they're willing to allow that that kind of deregulated ability, even though they're way what you would call probably third world on their supply of power. So the lesson learned from them is it isn't necessarily the Europe or the people that you think are the most advanced. Some of the other ones have the best opportunities. Great. Uh, Travis, Eric, Amy, uh, anything to add on what you're finding globally? Yeah, I think in parallel with Marty said, a little bit different uh, solution is, you know, in some of those areas where you've got, especially the island nations, you may not have the infrastructure, incredibly expensive burning diesel in some of those areas. Uh, we're seeing big uptick in microgrids. So come in with kind of call it a two to 10 megawatt solution that completely becomes their grid, which is PV and storage combined, uh, and getting rid of some of those diesel burns. So you may have some diesel backup in some, but I think we're going to start to see a lot of that type of adoption in addition to kind of some of the larger uh, countries such as India. But um, I think microgrids are, are very interesting in the future as well. I would just add in too, just um, staying with India because it is one of the highest emitting countries and is absolutely critical that it moves to um, to renewables. 
Um, we just issued, RE100 just issued a report focused on some case studies in India. Um, so I, I, I highly recommend folks like, taking a peek at that. So Infosys is one of the companies that's part of RE100, um, and they're mostly focused on, um, on solar. But again, it, it's that opportunity that A, the government is supporting um, renewables and uh, also off-grid. So it's a terrific opportunity, and we're seeing a tremendous amount of activity both at the corporate level as well as more into um, just getting the 360 million people in India that have no access to electricity at all, making sure that they have access to clean energy rather than diesel or kerosene. Great. And, and Travis, anything to add on your experiences internationally and, and how that's moving forward for you all? So uh, a couple of comments on this. You know, I think the issues and opportunities obviously vary by region. Um, you know, regulatory framework is one. Uh, you know, some jurisdictions are, are, are not deregulated, and so it, it makes it a little bit more difficult to take inroads there. Uh, attestation of any kind of third-party renewable generation, even if it's utility-based, uh, you know, it, to, to get that information and to be able to meet some sort of standard like WindMate or, or uh, you know, Greeny or something like that, something similar to that, becomes much more difficult outside developed nations. Um, supplier qualification. So, you know, talking about on-site installation, uh, and we had a brief conversation on the, uh, regarding this before the call. You know, finding the right partners, getting qualified suppliers, I installers, and so forth uh, becomes difficult in some regions. And then economics, um, you know, the simple economics of, of the project and payback. But if you look at it in in the context of cost containment, risk reduction and doing the right thing for the environment, you know, ultimately it will win out in the end. And, and you know, these, these issues will become opportunities and I think we'll continue to make inroads uh, throughout the world. So there are a lot of interesting, oh, go ahead. Yep. I just want to add something to what Travis said. Um, it was interesting and it's, and it's great. You know, we found that in some places, and, and India happened to be one of them, that there wasn't a good mechanism in place. The attestations, the credibility, et cetera, so instead of just saying no and not doing it, we went out and executed some some uh, supply contracts that were that were green, and we just didn't put them in a, as a reduction in our portfolio, but but we were still doing it, and then we're working on that attestation, working on that credibility, working on that mechanism to implement it, but it didn't mean that we do nothing while we wait. So uh, you know to add to what Travis said, um, that's a big issue in the countries, but it doesn't mean that we don't do anything. It just means you take it one step at a time. Excellent point. Um, I, I'm going to try to do something that I usually only do in person, but we're going to try it virtually. Um, and, and let's go in this order. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a statement and ask a question and have you each comment on it. So we'll go Marty, Eric, Amy, Travis. So Marty, Eric, Amy, Travis. So try it. So, so I want to help those in the audience better understand some of the sort of major factors that are influencing corporate energy decision-making process. Um, I want to throw out a few factors and get each of your quick reactions on how they're impacting your decisions or those of stakeholders. So first, I'm going to start with climate conference now taking place in Paris. Marty. Um, it'll be interesting. Uh, will it be talk or actions? We see a whole bunch of, of, of politics and people making statements and claims, uh, and, and I guess I want to see results. I believe in results more than promises. and Although we need the path, we need commitments, and we need people to act. Eric? Yeah, I'm definitely seeing a lot of, we're seeing a lot of activity, obviously, prior to the event of folks trying to get large projects done so they can announce them at the event. So definitely seeing a lot of push there to be part of that change. So uh, kind of seeing a number of projects that have been accelerated during that process. Amy, you're heading there later today. What's the take? Absolutely. Well, we need this agreement, everyone. <laughs> so we need to support it as much as you possibly can because we can't walk away without some success. It won't get us to where we won't keep us under two degrees Celsius, but it's going to be pointing us in the right direction that all investment is going to low carbon and zero carbon in the future. Great. Travis? Well, ultimately, you know, the outcome of the conference will inform our strategy. So, you know, we will adjust that as necessary moving forward. 
I think what we'll see in the shorter term is really a pull from our regions, those regions that uh, you know embrace climate change and embrace these kind of targets. You know, there'll be a pull from them. We want to we want to accelerate our conversion. We want to increase you know the the mix of renewables in the portfolio. And so I, I see this as a good thing, you know, for a, for a global enterprise. All right. Uh, next one is a, 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 a hotly discussed topic. Uh, potential pending expiration of the ITC. And I think we started with Marty. Um, I think it's going to be impactful. Wait and see if the industry and innovation and efficiencies can override it. I have a lot of faith in technology um, and the markets and people like Solar City to overcome that challenge. And I think there'll be a lot of shakeups in the players, lots of consolidation and changes. Eric. Yeah, so we're assuming the step down coming in by the end of 2016. So as Marty said, from a technology point of view, a couple of things we're doing, uh, launching our uh, facility in Buffalo, which will produce the highest efficiency panels in the world in the next year. So basically you're getting higher uh, output per square foot, you're getting higher efficiencies. Um, other technologies are, are, you know, it sounds very basic, but some of the racking systems uh, that we'll put in place, uh, the impact of those is, you know, where it used to take us a month to deploy a, 300 kW rooftop project, that same project would take us three days. So really reducing the BOS cost, the balance of systems, some of the labor aspects, um, and you've got higher efficiency. And then hopefully as battery storage, the storage prices come down as well, as you combo those, uh, you'll be able to deliver on the, on the savings. But it's really, you know, we're really driving towards uh, bringing down our, our system costs to be able to continue to provide uh, savings to customers post uh, ITC step down. Okay, so you're preparing for it and getting ready and lowering costs. Amy, next. No, and I applaud what Solar City is doing because I think that's you know we can't let something like an expiration of the ITC slow down what needs to happen in terms of accelerating renewable energy. So I just believe in the innovation of all the companies that are in RE100 to work around it and not let it uh, uh, deter their actions. Got it. And, and Travis, uh, any comment pending expiration of the ITC? Travis, do we still have you? Sorry, it's that mute button. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I comments of the other, other <laughs> panelists, obviously the increase in, uh, you know, technology and innovation, I think will offset the, you know, the tax credits. Increased panel efficiency, increased storage to offset demand charges, increased cost, and you know, really looking at customized so solutions, particularly for manufacturing, you know, where their load may be different than you know, say, a, a residential installation or you know, commercial. Got it. Okay, so thank you. Um, questions are starting to come in. I'm going to move to those shortly, um, but I want to ask everyone a quick question. Bill Gates has been in the news quite a bit. Uh, in the last few days. A as many of you know, he recently formed a, a new initiative that really builds off of many of the statements he's made in the past. Uh, the new initiative, for those who don't know, is called the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. And, and where they're focusing is on high-risk, long-term breakthrough energy bets. Um, while very laudable, it, it focuses more on R&D than on deployment. So just a quick question to our panelists, uh, and it doesn't have to be an either or, it could be a both and, but do those on the call believe we have the technologies today to reach the types of ambitious goals that we're talking about? Mr. Gates have it right where we need a, a whole bunch more of pretty, what he calls, I think, magical energy breakthroughs to get there. Amy, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, we have to be deploying the technology that we have, which creates the innovation and putting it out into the marketplace as quickly as possible. But I think what Bill announced is an important missing piece mm -hmm. of the puzzle still because we, we need every all hands on deck. He brought together a terrific group of people. Um, but it's not like we wait and we say, oh, let's stop doing this and let's wait until that breakthrough technology comes through. That, that can't happen. This is just we need several insurance policies on top of where we are if we're going to stay um, and to have a safe climate going forward. So I actually applaud it. I think it's great. Eric, what's what's your take on do, do we have a lot of the, most of the technologies we need or is it sort of we need to just tackle it from both ends of the uh, innovation and deployment equation? 
Yeah, I mean, I, my perspective is I, I love it. I think you've got to tackle on both ends. Um, like Amy said, you know, we've got to drive with what we have now. I think we've got some great solutions in place. But I love to see, you know, folks have driven, you know, huge technology uh, sectors getting involved and, and hopefully driving new innovations. I mean, you know, from, from the, at the end of the day, we're delivering power to customers below grid. If there are other technologies out there we could leverage, I'd love to see them. We'd love to, to integrate them to our customers. Great. Anyone else want to comment on this before we move on to questions from the audience? Well, I, I guess from, from Intel standpoint, from my standpoint, um, the current technologies are the, are the base of the pyramid. They're, they're the foundation. But as we move up that pyramid and, and start picking fruit higher up in the tree, we need more, more technologies, more solutions, storage improvements, obviously. And, and of course, coming from a technology company, we technology is really going to drive the innovation for success here. And, and information, data, uh, being able to share that information, get it back to people so that they can act appropriately is really going to be a key to, uh, to reducing energy usage overall. I, I, this is Travis with BD. I think you know the, the scale here is important. I think the faster we deploy the technologies that we know are, are uh, currently available and, and, and you know effective, the faster the learning curve, you know, the 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 greater the improvements, the, the the improvements will be accelerated. That'll drive continued innovation. Um, you know, as Marty mentioned, the data we've got to have the data to understand where the opportunities are, and you know, all of this is it, it kind of works in in concert to ensure that you know the that the cycle improves and that the innovation continues to come and and not at the pace that we've seen but a much more rapid pace. Great. Well, this is a perfect segue to the first question from our uh, an audience member. Uh, they want to understand the pairing of storage and solar and is it really the game changer that it looks to be? And and I think what I'd add there is that obviously um you know when we track energy storage we're starting to see a lot of the cost breakthroughs that we saw in solar are starting to come to fruition. So, uh, Eric, I'd like to go to you first because you mentioned energy storage very early on. Mm -hmm. We've got this question from the audience member, sort of really trying to understand how it's going to impact the equation. So, could you talk a little bit about that? And then maybe we go to Amy, Marty, and Travis to see how they're either already deploying energy storage or thinking about it. So, Eric? Yeah, so it's somewhat obviously dependent on tariff, which state you're in. So there's no blanket across the U.S., uh, but obviously it's optimal in environments where you have a decent amount of peak load charges from the utility based on your tariff. Um, so storage, which is obviously an instantaneous release, can shave off those peaks and, and combine very well with PV. Uh, but I think as you start to kind of next generation storage, the concept is, okay, how do we put PV or how do you put storage perhaps in front of the meter? So now we're better integrated with the infrastructure in place, utilities in place, to provide information, in essence, enable them to potentially load ship uh, some of the renewables out there to better leverage all of these DG projects we're putting in place. So I think there's kind of the immediate peak load shaving, uh, some load shifting, you know, we did a 53 megawatt hour project, why the load shift, uh, and then down the line, you put that in front of the meter and really start to modify the relationship with, with the infrastructure that's out there today. And Eric, I think it's public, but you're doing some interesting stuff in Hawaii as well. Is that correct? Is that correct? Right? Correct. Yeah. So that is a great example of true load shifting. So now we've yeah, deployed exactly. a big chunk of PV. I don't know where we're at. 30 megawatts of PV in Kauai uh, will drop 53 megawatt hours of storage. And in essence, you get rid of the intermittent nature of PV now. So now the utility completely load shift the production of that PV. And when everyone comes home at five, six, seven o'clock, cranks up AC they now have that power when they need it. So once and it's really, you know. Go ahead. Go, go, well, let me just say, so I just want to say, so the important note there is that in this scenario, in this case or instance, the utility is your client. Correct. Correct. Okay. Great. So so let's move on for a second. I want to go to uh, Marty, Amy, and Travis. Are you starting to look at using energy storage? Are you already doing it? Or if not, people that you know are sort of considering it in, in, in terms of Amy. So I'll let either of you guys take that in any order. Um, okay. So, so yes, we are. Absolutely. We're doing it um, uh, with solar. Uh, we're looking at it on EV charging stations. 
where we now have a solar EV charging, and so we're using a battery to allow. It solves the intermittency issues, right? Yep. And so it's 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 the key to me. It's a silver bullet uh, for the wind and solar to make them the most efficient they can be. And so I think getting the cost down in that is really going to be a key. But we also need to to look at companies like ours. We run at a 90% load factor, so peak shaving isn't necessary as a company. Uh, as crucial for us, and in fact, we have several utilities who don't even have demand charges still. They just charge kilowatt hours. So there's a lot of factors here. We need to get the storage in place. We need to fix the rate structures um, and and apply it across. And Amy, say, Travis? Yeah, and the RE100 members, um, I mean, storage absolutely is the uh, missing piece, so agree with Marty. Um, and so everybody's looking at it, but they're definitely the leaders within RE100 that are beginning to deploy. So we need to get, have more of that, you know, testing and, and, and innovation and sharing happening, and I think we're going to see that accelerate over this year in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be pretty clear, Amy, we're having this conversation three to five years from now. There's a lot more uh, implementations that we could point to for sure. Um, uh, Travis, how about how about you all? Um, are, are you starting to look at energy storage as a part of your planning process? Yeah, so we're we're currently looking at this as an opportunity. I mean, particularly where our priorities would be where we have high demand charges, um, you know, and that depends on the utility rate structure, obviously. Where we have issues with system reliability, you know, so India was mentioned, we have several other. Uh, locations where utility reliability is a problem for us and, and recovery from an outage is, is a significant cost you know to the business um, peak load shifting obviously that's been mentioned as well you know the, the benefits here are the ability to use uh, more renewable energy around the clock right the wind doesn't always blow the sun doesn't always shine but if we can capture that energy when it's being generated and, and deploy that in other periods of the day that's extremely important. Um, the other things is, you know, it, it improves the infrastructure or frees up the uh, utility capacity in some cases, particularly where we may not have, you know, a 90% plus load factor uh, at a facility or where we would expect some, you know, peak loading to occur. And in addition to that, it's, you know, it's reliability, as Marty mentioned. So I think all of these play in concert to make this a winner you know the the technology um, needs to prove itself out, and uh, you, you know that it, it needs to be evaluated on a case by case basis. But certainly, it's a game changer. Yeah, and I think it's really next in line for uh, clean tech innovation. I think it's where we're going to see a lot of activity. Um, Amy and Eric, this is a question for you. Uh, the others can chime in, but I, I think it's a really interesting question. Are you starting to see that a company's energy mix is becoming a topic of either share, shareholder meetings uh, or Wall Street analyst briefings? Uh, Amy, I know you sort of come from the financial industry. Are you starting to see that where uh, they're either getting ratings or shareholders are making demands to, to move some of this forward? I'd love to get your take on that. Sure. Well, as everyone is probably familiar, there's a lot more activity happening in the investment space. So from the investor side, they were extremely interested in the RE100 campaign, mm -hmm. so have begun to start tracking companies. So again, I would think we will see that at this next cycle of annual meetings coming in. And as I'd also mentioned, that CDP will start tracking uh, the renewable side, so there'll be much more um, transparency and disclosure around um the usage, so I can only expect it will be much greater in the future. And for those who don't know, CDP is the Carbon Disclosure Project. It's a great organization, and uh, definitely check all that out. Uh, Eric, uh, are you finding anything on that end where you're, you're hearing? Uh, yeah, I, I think more that we're seeing is, is folks are starting to look at wallet spend, uh, look at, you know, I think the generation coming up now is looking at you know, as Marty talked about and Travis earlier about doing the right thing and using clean power, I think as folks are trying to look at the products they're buying and they're getting more and more information about what companies are doing, I think it's really going to impact uh, where they're buying products. And I think that's where Wall Street is 